It all started about a year ago when I moved into a new job at a marketing firm in Chicago. It wasn't anything special, just a standard 9 to 5 that paid the bills. I wasn't new to the city. But the company was in a different part of town. And I figured it was a good opportunity for a fresh start. The office itself was in a pretty typical corporate building. One of those places with bland gray carpets and fluorescent lighting. I had my own small cubicle, a few friendly co-workers, nothing out of the ordinary. The first time it happened, I didn't think much of it. One day, a package showed up on my desk. It was a small brown box with no return address. Just my name, written in neat handwriting, and the office's address. I opened it up, and inside was a little trinket. One of those tiny, cheap souvenirs you'd pick up from a tourist shop. It was a keychain with a small metal sculpture of the Willis Tower. I kind of laughed it off, figuring it was some kind of office prank. I asked around, but no one claimed to know anything about it. Everyone denied sending it, so I eventually tossed it into my desk drawer and moved on. A week later, another package showed up. This time, it was a postcard. No message, just a photo of Millennium Park with my name on the front in the same handwriting. Again, no return address. Now I was starting to get a little weirded out. I asked around the office again, trying to see if anyone was messing with me, but everyone just shrugged. My co-workers joked that I had a secret admirer, but it didn't feel that way to me. It felt off, but I still tried to laugh it off. Over the next few weeks, the packages kept coming. At first, they were all innocuous little things. Trinkets, postcards, things you could find in any tourist shop around the city. There was a snow globe of Navy Pier, a fridge magnet with the Chicago skyline, stuff like that. It was weird, but I figured maybe it was just some misguided attempt to be friendly. Maybe someone at work thought I was new to the city and wanted to give me some welcome to Chicago gifts. But the anonymity of it all made me uncomfortable. Then the packages started getting more personal. One day, I received a small jar of my favorite brand of coffee. I know that doesn't sound like much, but here's the thing. I had just switched to that brand a couple of weeks before. It was something I'd mentioned in passing to a co-worker, but I hadn't made a big deal out of it, so how did anyone know? My heart raced as I stared at the jar, and I felt a cold, creeping unease settle in. I considered throwing the jar away, but I hesitated. It was my favorite coffee after all, and part of me felt like I was just being paranoid. So I put it in the office kitchen and tried to forget about it. A few days later, another package arrived. This time, it was an exact replica of my house key. My stomach dropped when I opened that box. How on earth had someone gotten a copy of my key? I'd never lost my keys, never left them unattended. My hands shook as I looked at it. This was no joke. I went to HR and showed them the key, asking if they had any idea who might be behind the packages. They seemed just as confused and concerned as I was. They told me they'd look into it and asked if I wanted to file a police report. I hesitated. What could I even tell the police? That I was getting creepy packages at work? That someone had somehow gotten a copy of my key? I ended up deciding against it. I didn't have any real evidence and I didn't want to sound crazy. I changed the locks on my apartment the next day just to be safe. I even got a security camera installed outside my door. For a little while, things went quiet. No more packages showed up and I started to think maybe it had just been some elaborate prank. I still felt uneasy though, constantly looking over my shoulder, but there was nothing else I could do. A few weeks went by, and just when I was beginning to relax, the packages started coming again. This time, they weren't showing up at my office. They were being delivered to my apartment. I'd come home from work to find them sitting on the floor right outside my door. 
It was always the same, small brown boxes with my name and no return address. My heart sank every time I saw one. The first package I received at home contained a photo of my building taken from across the street. I stared at it, my hands shaking. The angle of the photo made it clear that whoever took it had been standing there watching, waiting. I felt sick to my stomach. Someone was following me. After that, they started arriving more frequently. Each package contained something more personal. A movie ticket stub from a show I'd seen the previous weekend. A coaster from the bar I sometimes went to after work. A tiny stuffed animal that looked exactly like the one I kept on my desk. I began to feel like I was losing my mind. Someone was tracking my every move. I started trying to change my routines, taking different routes to work, avoiding my usual haunts. But it didn't help. The packages kept coming, each one more invasive than the last. One morning I found a small USB drive in my mailbox. I took it inside, my hands trembling as I plugged it into my computer. There were dozens of pictures of me taken from different places around the city. Some were from across the street, others from inside shops, cafes, and even my own building's lobby. My heart pounded as I scrolled through them, feeling a wave of panic wash over me. I couldn't ignore it anymore. I went to the police, bringing everything with me. The packages, the photos, the USB drive. I tried to explain the situation as calmly as I could, but I felt hysterical. They took my statement, said they'd look into it, and promised to send a patrol car by my building periodically. But there wasn't much they could do. There were no fingerprints, no obvious suspects, nothing for them to go on. I left the station feeling even more helpless. I became paranoid jumping at every sound, constantly checking the locks on my door. I started avoiding people at work, unsure of who I could trust. I stopped using social media, thinking maybe that's how they were tracking me, but the packages kept coming. They knew where I lived, where I worked, even the places I went to unwind. Whoever was doing this was always one step ahead. One day I decided to take matters into my own hands. I set up a small camera facing the hallway outside my apartment door hoping to catch whoever was leaving the packages. I stayed up all night glued to the live feed on my phone. Hours passed with nothing, and I began to nod off, but then, just past 3 a.m., I saw a shadow. My heart pounded as I watched the figure move down the hallway towards my door. They were wearing a hoodie, the hood pulled up to hide their face. They approached my door, placed a package on the ground, and then, without a word, turned and walked away. I tried to get a better look at their face, but the camera angle wasn't great, and they moved too quickly. I replayed the footage over and over, trying to make out any identifying features, but it was no use. I didn't know who it was, but I now knew for certain that this person was targeting me specifically. I took the footage to the police the next day, but they still didn't have much to go on. They said they'd increase patrols in my area, but didn't seem optimistic about catching the person. The packages didn't stop. They kept coming, each one reminding me that I was being watched, followed, stalked. I started losing sleep, spending nights sitting in the dark, listening for any sound outside my door. I barely left my apartment unless it was absolutely necessary. I became a prisoner in my own home, trapped by fear and paranoia. Then, one evening, I came home from work and found the worst package yet. It was a small, plain box just like the others. My hands shook as I picked it up and brought it inside. I set it on the kitchen counter and slowly opened it, dreading what I might find. Inside was a single piece of paper folded neatly. I unfolded it and felt my blood run cold. It was a printout of a map with a route marked in red. It was my exact route from work to my apartment, traced out in precise detail. 
My heart pounded in my chest as I realized what it meant. They knew my every move. They were tracking me in real time. I stared at the map, my mind racing. How? How could they possibly know my route, especially when I'd been changing it every day? My thoughts spiraled, and I felt like I was losing control. Whoever this person was, they were always one step ahead, always watching. I grabbed the package and the map and rushed to the police again, practically begging them to do something. They promised to look into it, to patrol my route, to do what they could, but I could tell they were just as frustrated as I was. There was nothing concrete, nothing they could act on, just a string of creepy packages with no fingerprints, no evidence. Since then, I've been living on edge. I've moved to a different apartment, switched jobs, changed my routines yet again. I've tried to disappear to become a ghost in my own life. But no matter what I do, I can't shake the feeling that they're still out there watching, waiting. I haven't received any packages at my new place yet, but I check my mailbox with a sense of dread every day. I don't know who they are or what they want, and I don't know if I'll ever find out. All I know is that this isn't over, and that's the part that scares me the most. I moved into my new apartment in downtown Seattle about eight months ago. It was a small, old building with thin walls, but the rent was affordable, and it was close to work. My unit was on the second floor, across the hall from my only immediate neighbor. I noticed him the first day I moved in. A man in his thirties, thin, with short, dark hair. He didn't say much, just gave me a brief nod when I passed him in the hallway with my boxes. At first I was relieved. I didn't want to make small talk with neighbors anyway, especially not after moving from a noisy building where everyone was in each other's business. The first month was uneventful. I got into a routine of going to work, coming home, maybe watching some TV and going to bed. The neighbor across the hall stayed quiet. I'd occasionally hear the floorboards creak outside my door like someone walking to or from his apartment, but that was it. I assumed he kept to himself just like me. Things started to get weird about two months in. I'd come home from work and notice little things out of place. At first I thought I was just being forgetful. One day my keys weren't on the hook where I always left them. I found them on the kitchen counter instead. Another time I came home to find the living room window slightly open even though I was sure I'd closed it that morning. These were small things, easily chalked up to being in a hurry or not paying attention, so I didn't dwell on them. But it kept happening. I'd wake up in the morning and my bathroom door would be open, even though I always closed it before bed. My throw blanket on the couch would be folded differently, and my slippers weren't quite where I left them. I'd lose small items, too. Pens, hair ties, a keychain. Each time, I shrugged it off as my own carelessness, but it started to get under my skin. Then one night, things took a turn. I had come home late from work, exhausted and just wanting to crash. As I went through my usual routine, I noticed something on the floor near my front door, a small crumpled note. My first instinct was to think it was a flyer or something that had been slipped under the door, but when I picked it up and unfolded it, my heart skipped a beat. It was just a scrap of paper, but scribbled on it in shaky handwriting were the words, You looked so peaceful last night. I froze. I didn't understand what it meant. I stood there for a while, staring at the note, my mind racing. Who could have written this? And more importantly, how did they know what I looked like while I was sleeping? It was a creepy thought, but I tried to brush it off. I told myself it was probably just some kid in the building playing a prank. I crumpled the note and tossed it in the trash, trying to push it out of my mind. That night, I had trouble sleeping. 
I kept hearing little noises, creaks, and soft thuds from outside my bedroom. Every time I'd start to drift off, a new sound would jolt me awake. I told myself it was just the old building settling, or the neighbors next door, but deep down, I felt uneasy. The next morning, I woke up groggy and irritable. As I got out of bed, something caught my eye. On the nightstand next to me, there was another note. This one was on a torn piece of notebook paper, and the handwriting was the same shaky scrawl. You looked so pretty in your dreams. My stomach dropped. I couldn't convince myself this was a prank anymore. Someone had been in my apartment while I was asleep. I went to the front door and checked the lock. It was still locked from the inside. I had no idea how anyone could have gotten in. Panic set in, and I spent the rest of the morning checking every window, every closet, every possible way someone could have entered. Nothing was out of place, and there were no signs of forced entry. I considered calling the police, but what would I tell them? That I found a creepy note and felt like someone had been in my apartment? There was nothing concrete, nothing they could act on. I tried to go about my day, but I was paranoid now. I triple-checked the locks every time I left the apartment and blocked the windows with furniture. I even bought a small, cheap security camera online and set it up in my living room facing the front door. It was a basic model, but it made me feel a little safer, like I'd have some proof if anything happened again. For a while, nothing did. I'd still notice small things out of place, but I told myself it was just my imagination. Maybe I was moving things around without thinking, or maybe I was just paranoid from the notes. But I couldn't shake the unease. I started avoiding my apartment as much as possible, spending late nights at work or hanging out at a nearby coffee shop. I hated being in there alone. One night I came home later than usual. It was around midnight and the building was quiet as I walked up the stairs to my floor. As I approached my door, I noticed something on the ground. A small key. My heart pounded as I picked it up. It looked just like my apartment key. I immediately tried it in the lock, and to my horror, it worked. I felt a wave of nausea. Someone had a copy of my key. Someone had been coming into my apartment whenever they wanted. I rushed inside, slamming the door behind me, and searched the entire apartment. Every closet, every corner, under the bed, nothing. But I couldn't shake the feeling that I wasn't alone. I called a locksmith the next day and had the locks changed. I told the landlord I lost my keys and wanted to make sure no one else had a copy. He wasn't thrilled about it, but he agreed. For a little while I felt safer, thinking that whoever had been coming in before couldn't get in now. About a week later I was going through the footage on my security camera. I hadn't checked it in a while since I had started to feel a bit more secure. As I fast-forwarded through hours of nothing, something suddenly caught my eye. My heart skipped a beat as I watched the screen. In the early hours of the morning around 3 a.m., the front door opened slowly. A figure stepped inside, moving quietly into the living room. It was a man, my neighbor. I recognized him immediately. He stood there for a moment staring into the camera, then walked towards my bedroom. My stomach churned as I realized he knew exactly where the camera was and didn't care. He disappeared off screen for what felt like an eternity. When he finally reappeared, he walked back to the door and slipped out as silently as he had come in. I couldn't breathe. I rewound the footage and watched it again, hoping I was wrong that it was just a trick of the light or my imagination. But it was clear. He had a key. Even after I changed the locks, he had a way in. He had been in my bedroom while I slept. He had been watching me. I was frozen in fear. I didn't know what to do. 
I wanted to confront him to scream and demand an explanation. But what if he denied it? What if he had more copies of the key? What if he was dangerous? I spent the rest of the night sitting in the corner of my bedroom clutching my phone, listening for any sound. The next day, I went straight to the building manager and showed him the footage. He was shocked and promised to call the police. They came and took a report, watched the footage, and promised to investigate, but they didn't seem hopeful. They told me to stay with a friend if possible, and to keep my doors locked. It felt like they were brushing it off, like they didn't grasp the sheer terror I was living in. I packed a bag and left that same day. I stayed with a friend across town for a while, but I knew I couldn't stay there forever. The police said they questioned my neighbor, but he claimed he didn't know anything about the key or the notes. He denied everything. Without concrete evidence, there wasn't much they could do. I decided to break my lease and move out. I found another apartment in a different part of the city. It's been a couple of months now, and I haven't seen or heard anything strange. I installed more security cameras, put bars on the windows, and I barely sleep at night. Every little noise makes my heart race. I still don't know how he got the key or why he was doing it. Maybe he was just watching. Maybe it was something worse. I'll probably never know. All I know is that I'll never feel safe in my own home again. I'm an older woman, and last year I finally accepted that I needed some help around the house. It wasn't an easy decision. I've lived alone in my home in Portland for almost 20 years. My family suggested I get a caretaker to help with daily chores and errands. At first I resisted the idea. I've always been independent, but after a fall in the shower that left me with a sprained wrist, I had to admit it was time. I couldn't keep up with everything on my own. My daughter helped me find a service that connected me with a young woman named Emily. She seemed friendly and eager to help. During the interview, she came across as sweet, polite, and well-spoken. She had references and everything checked out. I felt a bit strange letting a stranger into my personal space, but Emily was respectful and didn't seem intrusive at all. I figured I'd give it a try. For the first few weeks, things went smoothly. Emily would come by every other day to help with groceries, laundry, and some light cleaning. She was friendly and considerate, always asking before moving things around or rearranging items in my cabinets. I started to feel comfortable with her. It was actually nice having someone to chat with, even if it was just about mundane things. She made my life a little easier and I was grateful for that. But slowly, little things started to change. At first, they were so small that I almost didn't notice. I'd find my clothing folded differently than the way I usually did it. I'm very particular about how I fold my towels and shirts, and Emily knew that. One day, I opened my closet to find my clothes arranged by color. It wasn't something I would have done, but I thought maybe Emily was just trying to be helpful. Still, I asked her not to do it again. She smiled and nodded, saying she just wanted to make things easier for me. Then I started noticing my personal letters had been moved. I keep a small desk in the living room where I sort my mail. I don't get a lot, mostly bills and the occasional card from family. I've always had a system. Mail I've read stays on the left side of the desk, unopened mail on the right, one day, I found that my mail had been rearranged. Letters I hadn't opened were now mixed in with the ones I had already looked through. It didn't make sense. I asked Emily if she'd touched my mail, and she denied it, looking almost hurt that I would suggest such a thing. I felt embarrassed for even asking. Maybe I was getting forgetful, but things kept getting stranger. Emily started showing up at my house outside of her scheduled times. She'd knock on the door and say she was just in the neighborhood and wanted to check on me. The first couple of times, 
I thought it was sweet, maybe a sign that she genuinely cared. But it began to happen more frequently, often at odd hours. She'd show up unannounced, claiming she'd forgotten to ask if I needed anything or that she was worried about me. It became unsettling. I didn't understand why she was so concerned about me. I wasn't sick or frail. I just needed help with some daily tasks. Then one evening, I was getting ready for bed when I heard a noise from the living room. It was around 10 p.m., far later than Emily's usual visits. I crept out of my bedroom, my heart pounding. To my shock, I found Emily standing there in the middle of my living room. She looked startled when she saw me, quickly explaining that she'd let herself in with the spare key I'd given her just in case. She claimed she had been worried because I hadn't answered my phone earlier in the day. The problem was I hadn't heard my phone ring. When I checked it, there were no missed calls from her. I stood there in my pajamas, feeling exposed and confused. I told her it was late and that I didn't need her to check in on me like that. She apologized profusely and left, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was very wrong. Why would she use the key to come in without calling first? And why lie about trying to call me? The next day, I decided to change the locks. I felt bad about it because she'd been so helpful, but I needed to set boundaries. I called a locksmith and had the work done while Emily wasn't scheduled to be around. I didn't say anything to her about it at first. I thought maybe if I put some distance between us, she'd get the message. A few days passed and everything was quiet. Emily came by during her normal times, but I noticed she seemed tense. She kept glancing at the front door as if expecting something. I tried to carry on as usual, pretending everything was fine, but I was on edge. I started double checking the locks before I went to bed and keeping my phone by my side at all times. Then one morning I woke up to find something that made my blood run cold. I keep a small figurine collection on a shelf in the living room, and one of them, a porcelain cat that my late husband had given me, was missing. I tore the living room apart looking for it, checking every nook and cranny, but it was nowhere to be found. I knew I hadn't moved it. It was always in the same spot, right next to the small clock on the shelf. I decided I needed to talk to Emily. When she arrived later that day, I tried to keep my voice calm as I asked if she had seen the figurine. She looked at me with wide eyes and shook her head, insisting she hadn't touched it. I pressed her further, saying it was very important to me, but she stuck to her story. Something in her eyes seemed off, though, like she was hiding something. The next few weeks were tense. I became increasingly paranoid. I noticed more things out of place. Small items moved around, drawers left slightly open. I stopped letting Emily into my bedroom altogether. I couldn't prove she was behind it, but I was certain she was snooping through my things. One evening, I was cleaning the kitchen when I found it, a small black object tucked behind the microwave. I pulled it out and my stomach turned. It was a camera. A tiny, hidden camera. I stared at it, my mind racing. How long had it been there? How many others could there be? I felt sick. I immediately called my daughter, who came over right away. We went through the entire house, searching for more cameras, but didn't find any. Still, the fact that one had been there at all was enough to terrify me. The next day, I confronted Emily I told her I'd found the camera and that I didn't need her help anymore. She tried to act shocked, saying she had no idea what I was talking about, but her face was pale and she wouldn't meet my eyes. I insisted she leave and she finally did, but not before mumbling something about only trying to keep me safe. I reported the incident to the agency that had connected us. They promised to investigate and said they'd take her off their list of caretakers. But that didn't make me feel any better. The idea that she had been watching me, possibly recording me without my knowledge, 
was horrifying. I felt violated in my own home. After she was gone, I tried to go back to my routine, but it wasn't the same. I was constantly on edge, jumping at every creak and shadow. I put up new curtains, bought extra locks for the windows, even considered installing a security system. But nothing made me feel completely safe. I started losing sleep, waking up at every little sound in the night. Then one day I was sorting through some old papers in my desk when I found something that made my heart stop. It was the porcelain cat, the one that had gone missing from the shelf. It was sitting there in the back of the drawer, behind some old receipts and documents. I hadn't put it there. I knew I hadn't. My hands shook as I picked it up, trying to make sense of it. Had she put it there? Had she been in my house again? I called the agency again, demanding answers, but they insisted she had no access to my house anymore. I didn't believe them. Someone had been in my home, moving my things. It felt like she was still around, even though I hadn't seen her in weeks. In the following days, I started noticing other things. My front door would be unlocked when I knew I had locked it. My mail started arriving already opened. And then, one afternoon, I found another camera. This one was hidden in the living room, inside a plant on the windowsill. I called the police this time. They came, took a report, and removed the camera, but they couldn't do much else. There was no proof linking it to Emily, and without that, their hands were tied. I changed the locks again, got a security system installed, and even put up cameras of my own. But it's been months now, and I still don't feel safe. I don't know how far she went or how much she knows about me. I don't know if she's watching me even now from some hidden corner. I try to go about my daily life. But every time I hear a noise or notice something slightly out of place, my mind jumps to the worst conclusions. I'm constantly on edge, waiting for the next sign that she's still there. Somewhere. I've been a high school teacher for about seven years now, and I've had my fair share of odd encounters with students. Working in a large school in San Francisco, you get all kinds. Some students are polite and engaged. Others are quiet and withdrawn. You get the jokers, the flirts, and the ones who just want to get through the day. I'm used to dealing with all sorts, so when I first got that anonymous love letter, I didn't think much of it. It was on my desk one Monday morning, a folded piece of lined notebook paper. The handwriting was messy, but readable. It said something about how I was the most beautiful person they'd ever seen and how they wished they could tell me in person. I laughed a little. It seemed harmless, like a silly high school crush, probably just some student with too much time on their hands. I tossed it into the drawer, planning to ignore it. Over the next couple of weeks, I found more notes. At first, it was once or twice a week. Then it started happening almost daily. They'd be on my desk in the morning, or slipped into the pile of papers on the corner. They were always short, never more than a few sentences, and always anonymous. They all followed the same pattern. Compliments about my appearance, admiration for the way I taught. It was getting a little weird, but I didn't feel threatened. Teenagers get crushes on their teachers all the time. It's awkward, but usually harmless. I mentioned it to a few co-workers in the teacher's lounge, and they mostly shrugged it off. One of them joked that I had a secret admirer. Another suggested that I keep an eye out for any students acting odd. They all seemed to think it was nothing serious. I started to pay more attention to my students, trying to see if any of them were watching me more than usual, but I couldn't pinpoint anyone. Everyone seemed normal just the usual mix of teenagers dealing with the stress of school. But then, the notes changed. They became more detailed, more personal. 
One morning, I found a note describing the outfit I'd worn the day before, down to the color of my scarf and the brand of my boots. That one made me pause. How had they noticed something like that? I didn't think any of my students paid that close attention. I started feeling a bit unsettled. Whoever was writing these notes was watching me closely, and that was no longer the innocent crush I'd assumed it was. I started being more careful about what I wore to school, opting for less noticeable outfits, things that blended into the background. But the notes kept coming. They described the way I styled my hair, the jewelry I wore, even my choice of nail polish. I stopped wearing any. I stopped putting much effort into my appearance at all, hoping that whoever it was would lose interest. It didn't help. Then one day I found a note on my car windshield. It was tucked under the wiper, waiting for me when I left the school building. My stomach flipped as I opened it. The note described the exact outfit I was wearing that day, but this time it was written in present tense. They must have written it while I was inside the school. That realization made me freeze. Whoever was doing this wasn't just a student passing by my classroom. They were watching me constantly, closely. I went back inside the building and told the administration about the notes. They took it seriously and said they'd look into it. They suggested checking the security footage of the parking lot but the cameras weren't positioned in a way that showed my car directly. They could see me walk to my car, but they couldn't see who had left the note. It was frustrating. I felt exposed, like my privacy was being violated. The school promised to keep an eye out, but I wasn't sure what they could really do. I tried to shake it off and go about my day, but it was starting to get under my skin. I was constantly glancing over my shoulder, checking to see if anyone was paying too much attention to me. In the classroom, I'd scan the rows of students, trying to spot anything out of the ordinary. But they all acted the same as always. Chatting, joking, not paying too much attention unless I was calling on them. No one stood out. I couldn't tell if that made me feel better or worse. The notes kept coming. They showed up in random places now, inside my desk drawer, slipped into the stack of papers I graded at home, even in my coat pocket once. That one nearly sent me into a panic. How had they managed that? I started double-checking my belongings, locking my classroom door whenever I left. But it didn't matter. Whoever was doing this was finding ways to get to me. Then, one afternoon, I stayed late to finish some grading. Most of the staff had already left, and the building was quiet. I had just turned off my classroom lights and was gathering my things when I noticed a piece of paper on my chair. My heart pounded as I picked it up. It was another note. But this one was different. It was longer, more detailed. It described moments from my daily life that I hadn't shared with anyone. It mentioned how I spent my lunch breaks in the staff room, how I walked the same route to the local coffee shop every Wednesday morning. It even referenced a specific book I'd been reading at home. I nearly dropped the paper. That book never left my house. No one should have known I was reading it. I rushed to the front office, but it was after hours, and everyone had gone home. I went straight to my car, my heart racing the whole time. I felt like someone was watching me but I didn't look around, I just wanted to get out of there. I drove straight home, locked the doors, and stayed up all night replaying everything in my head. How could they know these details? Were they following me outside of school? I took the note to the school administration the next day. They promised to take it to the police, to get them involved, but I could tell they didn't know what to do. I was scared. I started changing my routines, taking different routes to work, eating lunch in my classroom instead of the staff room. I avoided going out as much as possible, but the notes kept coming. The tipping point came one Friday. 
I'd finished up a late meeting and was walking back to my car. It was dusk. The parking lot was nearly empty and my car was parked farther away than usual. As I approached it, I noticed something on the ground by the driver's side door. I hesitated, a chill running down my spine. I forced myself to walk forward and picked it up. It was another note, but this time, it wasn't just a piece of paper. It was a photograph. A photo of me, sitting at my desk looking down at some papers. It was taken from inside the classroom. The angle was from the back of the room, like someone had been sitting there quietly watching and I hadn't noticed. My hands shook as I looked at it. I didn't understand. How could I not have seen them? I ran back inside, clutching the photo, and found the principal still in his office. I showed him the picture, my voice trembling. He looked as disturbed as I felt and immediately called the police. They came and took my statement, took the photo as evidence, and said they'd increase patrols around the school. But they also told me something that made my stomach drop. They said that unless I had a specific suspect, there wasn't much they could do. Over the next week, things escalated. I started finding more photos on my desk, inside my mailbox at home, even in my purse once. They were all pictures of me taken from different places around the school and outside. Some were from a distance, others were close up. One even showed me walking into my own apartment. I felt trapped, paranoid. I had no idea who was doing this or why, and it felt like they were closing in on me. Then one morning a student was expelled for unrelated reasons. He was known for causing trouble skipping classes, getting into fights, the usual teenage rebellion. I'd had him in my class the previous semester, but he'd never been particularly interested in me or my lessons. When I heard about his expulsion, I thought nothing of it at first. It wasn't until I received another note the next day that things clicked. This note was different from the others. It was sloppily written, hurried, and almost angry. It talked about how I ignored him, how I never paid attention to him, and how I didn't appreciate his feelings. My blood ran cold. I finally had an idea of who might be behind all of this. I went straight to the administration with my suspicions. They informed the police, who then questioned the student. They searched his belongings, and according to what I later found out, they discovered a notebook filled with obsessive notes about me, including times and dates of my activities both in and out of school. The photos I'd been receiving were in there too, along with a detailed log of every interaction he'd had with me, no matter how brief or insignificant. But even knowing this didn't bring me peace. The police told me he'd been expelled and was now banned from school property. But there wasn't much more they could do unless he directly... It was longer, more detailed. It described moments from my daily life that I hadn't shared with anyone. It mentioned how I spent my lunch breaks in the staff room, how I walked the same route to the local coffee shop every Wednesday morning. It even referenced a specific book I'd been reading at home. I nearly dropped the paper. That book never left my house. No one should have known I was reading it. I rushed to the front office, but it was after hours, and everyone had gone home. I went straight to my car, my heart racing the whole time. I felt like someone was watching me, but I didn't look around. I just wanted to get out of there. I drove straight home, locked the doors, and... I've always been pretty active on social media. I live in Atlanta, and I love the city, the nightlife, the parks, the food scene, all of it. I had accounts on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, you name it. Most of my profiles were public and I would regularly post about my daily life. Photos of brunch with friends, my morning jogs at Piedmont Park, new outfits, or even just my latest coffee spot discovery. I didn't think much about privacy settings because honestly, who would care enough to follow me around in real life? I was just a regular person sharing regular things. 
about eight months ago, something changed. It started in a way that didn't really register as unusual at first. I'd come home from work or a night out and find little things out of place. My shoes would be moved slightly from where I'd left them or a cupboard door in the kitchen would be left ajar when I knew I had closed it. I thought it was just me being forgetful. I lived alone in a small apartment and sometimes when I was rushing out the door, I didn't always notice the details. Still, it was enough to nag at me. Then one day I noticed something odd on my Instagram. Someone had liked nearly every single one of my photos, even the old ones from years back. The profile didn't have a name, just a generic username made up of random letters and numbers. The profile picture was blank and there were no posts. I didn't think much of it. There were always bots and weird accounts floating around social media. I just ignored it and went about my day. A week or so later, I started getting direct messages from random accounts on my Instagram and Facebook. Some were just general comments on my posts, but a few were more specific. One message commented on a photo I'd posted that day saying how nice I looked in my blue dress. The thing is, I hadn't posted anything mentioning the dress. I had worn that outfit to work and snapped a photo, but I never uploaded it. That gave me pause. How did this person know what I was wearing? I tried to brush it off as a lucky guess. Maybe someone who'd seen me on my way to work and followed me on social media, but it still creeped me out. I set my accounts to private and went through my followers list, removing anyone I didn't recognize. For a while, that seemed to work. The strange messages stopped, and I went back to my usual routine, posting pictures and updates, though with a bit more caution. A few weeks later, I went on a weekend trip to Savannah with some friends. I posted a few photos during the trip, pictures of the historic district, a sunset over the river, and a selfie with my friends at dinner. When I got back to Atlanta, I found a note taped to my front door. It was handwritten on a small piece of notebook paper, and all it said was, Hope you had a great time in Savannah. My heart skipped a beat as I stared at it. Someone had been to my apartment while I was away. Someone who knew I'd been in Savannah, even though I'd been careful about my posts. I felt a wave of nausea. My mind raced trying to figure out who could have left the note. None of my friends would have done something like that as a joke. I thought about calling the police, but what could I say? Someone left me a note? It wasn't a direct threat, just unsettling. I took the note, crumpled it up, and threw it away. Then I checked every window and door lock in my apartment. For the next few days, I was on edge. I stopped posting altogether and avoided telling anyone online about my plans. I even changed my phone number and set up a new email address thinking maybe someone had hacked into my accounts. It didn't help. One evening I came home after a long day at work and found my living room completely rearranged. My heart sank as I stood in the doorway, staring at the scene in front of me. The couch had been moved a few feet to the left. The coffee table was pushed against the wall. Even my books were stacked differently on the shelf. I rushed through the apartment, checking every room, but nothing was missing. It was all there, just moved. I was terrified. Someone had been in my apartment, had taken their time to move my things around, and then left without a trace. I called the building manager and he came up to check the locks. They were still intact, no signs of forced entry. He suggested maybe I'd moved things myself and forgotten. I felt like I was losing my mind, but I knew I hadn't done it. I asked if anyone else had a key to my apartment, and he assured me that only he and I had access. After that, I changed the locks and installed a cheap security camera in my living room, pointed at the front door. I didn't know if it would help, but I needed some peace of mind. For the next few days, I barely slept, 
I kept checking the footage on the camera whenever I heard a noise. But nothing happened. The apartment stayed just as I left it. Then a few days later, I got a notification on my phone. The camera had detected motion. My heart pounded as I pulled up the live feed. At first I didn't see anything. The front door was still closed, and everything in the living room looked normal. I rewound the footage and watched in horror as the door slowly opened. A figure stepped inside, wearing dark clothes and a baseball cap pulled low over their face. They stood there for a moment, then walked towards the camera, reaching up to adjust it slightly. Then they turned and left, closing the door softly behind them. I felt sick. I watched the clip over and over, trying to make out any details about the intruder. But the camera's angle wasn't great. I couldn't see their face clearly. I called the police, finally realizing how serious this was. When they arrived, I showed them the footage, hoping they could do something. They took my statement, the camera, and the video, but they didn't sound hopeful. There was no clear shot of the person's face, and they hadn't done anything beyond entering the apartment. After the police left, I sat on my couch, staring at the door. Whoever was doing this knew where I lived, knew how to get inside, and apparently didn't care that I might find out. I didn't sleep that night. I stayed on the couch, clutching my phone, listening to every creak and thud the building made. I felt trapped in my own home. The next morning I decided to stay with a friend for a while. I packed a bag and left, only returning to the apartment to pick up mail or grab more clothes. I asked the building manager to keep an eye out for anything suspicious, but he didn't seem convinced that there was a real problem. He suggested I talk to the police again if I felt unsafe, but what more could they do? I stayed away from my apartment for over a week, but eventually I had to go back. I needed to check on things make sure nothing else had been tampered with. When I walked in, everything looked just as I'd left it. I let out a sigh of relief, thinking maybe, just maybe, the whole ordeal was over. But then I noticed a photograph on the coffee table. I picked it up, my hands trembling. It was a picture of me sitting at a cafe near my office. I recognized the place immediately. It was one of my regular morning stops for coffee. In the photo, I was sitting alone, looking down at my phone, completely unaware that someone was watching me. I dropped the photo and backed away, my mind racing. They had been following me, watching me outside of my home. I grabbed my bag and left, not bothering to lock the door behind me. I went straight to the police station, this time practically begging them to do something. They took the photo and promised to patrol the area around my building more frequently. They also advised me to stay with a friend or family member if I felt unsafe. I left the station feeling more hopeless than ever. Over the next few weeks, I started noticing strange things happening again, even while I was staying with my friend. My car would be parked in a slightly different spot when I returned to it. Items in my bag would go missing and then show up again days later. I stopped posting anything online, stopped using social media entirely. I changed my phone number again, but I still felt exposed. Then, one morning, I found another photograph slipped under my friend's front door. It was a picture of my apartment building taken from across the street. It was grainy like it had been shot from a distance, but it was unmistakably my building. I stared at it, feeling my stomach drop. They knew where I was staying. I left the city for a while after that, staying with family in another state. I didn't tell anyone I was leaving, didn't post anything online. I just packed up and left. But the whole time, I felt like I was being watched, like eyes were following me everywhere I went. Even now, months later, I still look over my shoulder every time I go out. 
I haven't received any more photographs or notes, but I can't shake the feeling that whoever it was is still out there somewhere. I moved to Chicago for a new job and found a decent apartment in the Lakeview area. It wasn't exactly cheap, but it was in a safe neighborhood, and I liked the idea of being close to the lake. The place was a two-bedroom in an older building with some character, creaky floors, narrow hallways, you know the kind. The extra room was more space than I needed, so I decided to look for a roommate to split the rent. After posting an ad online and sifting through a few responses, I found someone who seemed normal enough. Her name was Lily. She was around my age in her mid-twenties, worked in the city, and had good references from previous roommates. She seemed quiet and easygoing, not overly friendly, but polite. We met at a coffee shop, and everything checked out. I gave her a tour of the apartment, and she agreed to move in the following week. At first, things were fine. She kept mostly to herself, spending a lot of time in her room. That was fine by me. I'm not super social, and I liked having my own space. We didn't interact much beyond the usual small talk when we ran into each other in the kitchen or living room. The first couple of weeks passed without incident, and I was starting to think I'd lucked out with an ideal roommate situation. Then little things started happening. I'd noticed lights left on in the living room when I was sure I'd turned them off before going to bed. The first time it happened, I just assumed it was my mistake. I'd been busy and probably forgot. But then it happened again and again. One morning, I walked into the kitchen to find the refrigerator door slightly open. I had this habit of double-checking that everything was closed and turned off before I went to bed so I knew it wasn't me. I asked Lily about it, and she just shrugged, saying maybe she got up for a snack in the middle of the night. It seemed like a reasonable explanation, so I didn't press further. I tried to push it out of my mind, but I started feeling uneasy in my own home. Then, there was the food. Stuff in the fridge would go missing, or I'd find half-empty containers that I hadn't touched. One time, an entire carton of milk disappeared overnight. I asked Lily about it, and she gave me this blank look, like she didn't know what I was talking about. I didn't want to start a confrontation, so I let it go, telling myself it was just a minor annoyance. But things started to escalate. I'd come home from work to find my bedroom door open when I knew I'd left it closed. My drawers would be slightly open, or things inside them would be rearranged. I asked Lily if she'd been in my room, but she denied it. She acted almost insulted that I'd even suggest such a thing. I didn't have any proof, so I couldn't accuse her of anything, but I knew something wasn't right. One night, I woke up to a creaking sound coming from the hallway. It was faint, but in the dead silence of the apartment, it was enough to jolt me awake. I lay there, listening, my heart pounding. It sounded like footsteps. I sat up in bed, straining to hear, but everything had gone quiet. I told myself it was probably just the building settling or the neighbors upstairs. I eventually managed to fall back asleep, though it took a while. The next morning I found my bedroom door open again. I distinctly remembered closing it before I went to bed. I felt a pit in my stomach as I looked around my room. My closet door was also open, just a crack. I walked over and opened it fully, half expecting to find someone standing there. It was empty. I checked the rest of my room, but nothing seemed out of place. Still, the thought that someone might have been in there while I was sleeping was enough to make me feel sick. I decided to install a lock on my bedroom door. I didn't tell Lily about it, just went to the hardware store, bought a simple latch, and put it on that afternoon. It wasn't much, but it made me feel a bit safer. 
That night, I locked my door and tried to sleep, though every little noise set me on edge. The apartment was old and it creaked a lot, but every sound made my heart race. Around 3 a.m., I woke up to a faint scratching sound. It was soft but persistent, like someone was trying to open the door. I sat up, my eyes fixed on the door, holding my breath. The scratching stopped, and then I heard footsteps, slow and deliberate, moving away from my room. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. The next morning, I checked the door. There were faint marks around the latch, as if someone had been trying to pick the lock. My blood ran cold. I confronted Lily as soon as she came out of her room, asking if she'd been trying to get into my room. She looked at me with wide eyes and shook her head, saying she had no idea what I was talking about. She seemed so calm, so unconcerned, that I didn't know what to think. Was she lying, or was something else going on? I considered calling the police, but what would I say? My roommate might have tried to get into my room. There was no evidence. Just some scratches on the door. It felt like a stretch. Instead, I decided to buy a small camera to set up in my room. I put it on a shelf facing the door, hoping it would catch something if Lily was sneaking around. For the next few days, nothing happened. I locked my door every night and checked the footage every morning. It was always the same. Just me locking up, getting into bed, and then nothing. I started to think maybe I was overreacting, that I was just being paranoid. Maybe Lily was telling the truth and I was imagining things. Then one night I woke up to a sound that made my blood run cold. It was the sound of the door handle jiggling. I sat up in bed staring at the door, my heart thumping in my chest. The handle rattled again more forcefully this time and then it stopped. I heard a faint sigh from the other side of the door, followed by slow, soft footsteps retreating down the hallway. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. I just sat there staring at the door waiting for something to happen. When morning finally came, I checked the camera footage. My hands were shaking as I fast forwarded through the night. Around 2.30 a.m., the door handle started moving. I watched, horrified, as the door rattled on the screen. Then I saw it, Lily's face. She was staring at the door, her expression blank, almost empty. She tried the handle again, then leaned her head against the door, standing there for what felt like an eternity before finally turning and walking away. I watched the footage over and over, trying to make sense of it. Why was she doing this? What did she want? I felt a wave of nausea wash over me. I needed to get out of there. I grabbed my phone and called a friend, asking if I could stay with them for a few days. I didn't give any details, just said I needed a place to crash. I packed a bag as quickly as I could and left the apartment. I didn't say anything to Lily. I just grabbed my things and walked out. When I got to my friend's place, I finally told them everything. They looked at me with a mix of horror and disbelief. We watched the footage together and they agreed. I needed to call the police. The police came to the apartment the next day. I showed them the footage and they questioned Lily, but she denied everything. She claimed she had no idea what I was talking about, that she'd never tried to get into my room. Without solid evidence of a crime, there wasn't much they could do. They suggested I find a new place to live if I felt unsafe. I returned to the apartment with the police to grab more of my belongings. Lily was there, standing in the hallway as I packed up my things. She didn't say a word, just watched me with that same blank expression. I felt a chill run down my spine as I avoided her gaze. I finished packing and left as quickly as I could. I moved out within the week. 
I found a new place on the other side of the city and changed my phone number. I haven't seen or heard from Lily since, but I can't get the image of her face out of my mind. I live in a quiet suburb outside of Boston with my husband and our two kids, ages five and eight. We're a pretty normal family, juggling work, school, and after-school activities. A few months ago, my husband and I decided to hire a babysitter so we could have an occasional date night. After sifting through profiles online and doing interviews, we found a young woman named Claire who seemed perfect. She was in her early 20s, studying early childhood education at a nearby college and had glowing references from previous families. She came over a few times before we officially hired her just to get to know the kids and let them get comfortable with her. Everything seemed fine. The kids liked her. She was polite and attentive. So we started scheduling her for the occasional evening here and there, mostly on weekends. It was nice to get out of the house for a few hours, just my husband and me. At first, Claire seemed like a dream come true. She always arrived on time, brought little activities for the kids, and kept the house neat. She'd text me updates throughout the evening, letting me know how things were going. I was relieved to have found someone so reliable. But as the weeks went by, I began to notice a few small, odd things. I'd come home to find certain items moved in strange ways. Picture frames on the mantle would be turned slightly, or the throw pillows on the couch would be rearranged. The kids' toys would be put away in places they didn't belong. It wasn't anything major, just enough to catch my eye. I chalked it up to Claire tidying up and not knowing exactly where things went, so I didn't think much of it. Then, I started noticing that Claire was asking a lot of questions about our schedule. She'd casually slip them into conversation while I was getting ready to leave. She'd ask about what time we usually came home from work, or if we had any plans for the weekend. At first, I figured she was just being polite, making small talk. But then, her questions started getting more specific, like whether my husband would be working late on certain days or when the kids' after-school activities ended. It felt a little intrusive, but I brushed it off as her being thorough. One night, my husband and I came home from dinner to find Claire standing in the hallway, holding one of our wedding photos. She looked startled when we walked in. She quickly put the frame back and apologized saying she had just been dusting and accidentally knocked it over. I felt a bit uneasy, but I let it slide, not wanting to make a big deal out of it. Things started getting weirder after that. One evening, I was looking through my phone's photo gallery and noticed a few pictures I didn't remember taking. They were photos of our living room, the kids' bedrooms, and even one of my husband's office. I felt a chill run down my spine. I checked the timestamps on the photos, and they had all been taken during times when Claire was babysitting. I hadn't given her my phone, so how did they get there? I confronted her about it the next time she came over. I tried to keep my tone light, asking if she'd accidentally used my phone to take some pictures. She gave me a wide-eyed look of surprise and denied it, saying she would never do that without asking. She even offered to let me look through her phone to prove she hadn't taken any pictures. Feeling a bit embarrassed for even asking, I backed off and dropped the subject. But the whole thing left me feeling unsettled. From then on, I started paying closer attention. I'd leave small, subtle traps around the house when she babysat like placing a piece of tape over the kids' bedroom drawers or setting up certain objects in a specific way to see if they'd been moved. Every time we came home, I'd check. And almost every time, things had been tampered with. Toys had been rearranged. Papers in my husband's office were shuffled around and kitchen cabinets had been opened and closed. I told my husband about my suspicions, and he agreed that something felt off. We decided to set up a couple of small cameras in the main rooms. They weren't super obvious, but not exactly hidden either. 
I placed one in the living room and one in the kitchen, figuring that would cover the areas she spent the most time in with the kids. The next time Claire came over, I felt anxious the whole evening. I couldn't focus on our dinner or conversation. I just wanted to get home and check the footage. When we finally got back, Claire was her usual cheerful self. She said the kids had gone to bed without any fuss and that everything had gone smoothly. We paid her and she left. As soon as she was gone, I pulled up the camera feed on my phone. The footage was mostly uneventful. There were long stretches where nothing happened except for the kids playing or watching TV. But then about halfway through the evening, I saw something that made my stomach drop. In the living room footage, Claire was standing in front of our bookshelf, carefully pulling out a photo album. She opened it and started flipping through the pages, looking at pictures of our family, vacations, holidays, birthdays. She went through the entire album page by page before placing it back exactly where she found it. I showed the footage to my husband, and we both felt a mix of anger and fear. Why was she snooping through our personal things? What was she looking for? We decided that we couldn't let her babysit anymore. But we needed to handle it delicately to avoid any potential fallout. We agreed that we'd tell her we didn't need a sitter for a while and hoped that would be the end of it. The next day, I sent her a text, thanking her for all her help, but saying that our schedules had changed and we wouldn't be needing a babysitter for a while. She replied quickly, saying she understood and to let her know if we ever needed her again. I felt a sense of relief wash over me. Maybe it was all in my head. Maybe she really was just overly curious. A week passed and I started to relax. Then one evening, I was scrolling through social media when I stumbled across something that made my blood run cold. On Claire's Instagram account, Buried deep in her gallery were pictures of our house. The first few were innocuous, showing the outside of our house, the yard, the front door. But as I scrolled further, I found photos of the inside, our living room, the kids' play area, even a shot of my husband's office. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Some of these pictures were the exact ones I'd found in my phone. She'd somehow accessed my phone, transferred the pictures, and posted them to her account. I showed my husband and we both felt sick. We had to do something. I took screenshots of the photos and immediately called the police. They came to the house and took a report. They asked us for all the information we had on Claire, which wasn't much beyond her contact details and the few references we had checked before hiring her. They said they'd look into it but there wasn't a lot they could do unless we could prove she had taken the photos without our permission. The next morning, I noticed something even more disturbing. Claire's Instagram account had been updated. There was a new photo. It was a picture of the outside of our house taken that morning. My car was in the driveway, exactly where I had parked it the night before. She had been there, outside our house, watching us. I felt a surge of panic. I locked all the doors and called the police again, but they said there wasn't enough evidence to take any immediate action. My husband and I decided to install a more comprehensive security system, including cameras covering every entrance to the house. I also contacted the building manager to have the locks changed. That evening, I checked every window and door before going to bed. The kids were already asleep and I felt exhausted. My nerves completely frayed. Sometime in the middle of the night, I woke up to a noise. It was faint, like a soft scraping sound coming from downstairs. I sat up in bed, straining to hear. My husband was still asleep beside me. I grabbed my phone and checked the live feed from the security cameras. The front door camera showed nothing unusual. I switched to the camera covering the living room and my heart stopped. There, standing in the middle of the room, was Claire. 
She was facing the camera, holding something in her hands. It looked like a piece of paper. She was staring directly at the camera, not moving, not blinking. I felt a wave of terror wash over me. I woke my husband, whispering that Claire was inside the house. He grabbed the phone from me and saw the same image. We called the police, our voices hushed with fear. As we waited, we watched the camera feed. Claire stayed in the living room, still as a statue, staring at the camera. After what felt like an eternity, the police arrived. We watched on the feed as they entered the house, guns drawn and approached Claire. She didn't resist. They handcuffed her and led her outside. Later, we found out that the paper she had been holding was a photograph. It was a picture of our family, taken during one of her babysitting sessions. She had written something on the back, but the police wouldn't let us see it right away, citing it as evidence. They took her into custody and we gave our statements. We've since installed even more security measures around the house and we're trying to move on, but every creak and shadow in the house makes me jump. I still wonder what exactly she was looking for in our lives. I don't think we'll ever really know. A few months ago, I started noticing little gifts on my desk at work. I work in a large office building in New York City, one of those modern places with glass walls and an open floor plan. My job can be stressful, so when I found a small bouquet of flowers waiting for me one Monday morning, it actually brightened my day. There was no card, just a simple arrangement of daisies and roses sitting in a glass vase. I asked around the office thinking it might be from a colleague or a thank you for a project I'd helped with recently, but nobody claimed responsibility. It became a bit of an office mystery and my co-workers joked that I had a secret admirer. I laughed it off, thinking it was a sweet gesture, probably from some shy co-worker who didn't want to come forward. Over the next few weeks, the gifts continued. It was never anything extravagant, a box of chocolates, a small candle, or a new coffee mug. At first, I found it flattering, even a little exciting. I didn't think too much about it. People in the office started teasing me, and I joined in the fun. We all tried to guess who it might be, listing off names of people in the building, but we couldn't figure it out. But then the notes started. They were short, always handwritten on small, plain cards. The handwriting was neat, almost too neat, like someone had taken their time to make it look perfect. The first few notes were innocent enough, they said things like, you have a beautiful smile, or you light up the room. Sweet, but vague. I didn't have any reason to feel uneasy at that point, so I just filed them away in my desk drawer and kept on with my daily routine. One day I found a note that made me pause. It was simple, just a few words. You looked lovely in that blue dress yesterday. I felt a chill run down my spine. I had worn a blue dress to work the day before, but I hadn't posted any pictures online or mentioned it to anyone outside the office. How did they know? I asked a few colleagues again, trying to see if someone would fess up, but everyone denied knowing anything about it. It was starting to feel less like a cute office romance and more like something else. Over the next few weeks, the notes became more personal, more specific. One mentioned how I liked to go to a particular coffee shop before work. Another described my walk home, down to the exact street I took. I started getting uneasy. How did they know these things? I always walked alone, and I didn't talk about my routines with anyone at work. The thought that someone was following me began to creep into my mind. I told my boss about the notes and the gifts. He listened, concerned, and said he'd keep an eye out. He even suggested that I let security know, just in case. I agreed, and security reviewed the building's camera footage to see if they could spot anyone leaving the gifts on my desk. But they found nothing. 
whoever was leaving them must have been doing it at night, after the cameras were turned off or angled away. The next gift I received wasn't left on my desk. It was in my car. I found it one evening after work when I walked to the parking garage. It was a small stuffed bear sitting in the passenger seat, a note pinned to its chest that simply said, I'm always with you. I froze, staring at it through the window. My car had been locked. I checked it three times before going into the office that morning, and it was locked again when I left for lunch. Someone had been inside my car. My hands shook as I unlocked the door and grabbed the bear. I tossed it into the back seat, then drove straight home, my mind racing. That night, I barely slept. I went over everything in my head trying to piece together who could be doing this. I considered calling the police, but what would I say? Someone left a bear in my car? I decided to change my routine, hoping that might throw them off. I started taking different routes to work, getting coffee at a different shop, and varying my lunch breaks. I even parked my car in a different spot in the garage each day. For a little while, it seemed to work. No more notes, no more gifts. I started to feel like maybe it had been some elaborate prank that had finally run its course. Then one morning I found another note on my desk. This one was longer, written in the same neat handwriting as the others. It described my new routes to work in detail, mentioning the coffee shop I'd started going to and how they missed our old routine. My stomach twisted as I read it. They were still following me. They had just been waiting for the right moment to make it known. I told my boss again, and this time, he looked genuinely worried. He suggested I take a few days off, maybe go out of town. I agreed. I needed some time to clear my head and figure out what to do next. I took a couple of days off and stayed with a friend across the city, hoping that putting some distance between me and my apartment might help. When I finally returned to work, I found my office had been untouched. No new gifts, no new notes. I started to relax, thinking that maybe my time away had scared them off. But then, a few days later, I noticed something strange. My office computer was acting slow, like it was lagging. I called IT, and they took a look at it. They ran some scans and found a remote access program installed on the computer. Someone had been logging in remotely and watching everything I did on my screen. They traced the software back to an IP address in the building. My heart pounded as they pulled up the logs. Whoever it was had been accessing my computer regularly, watching my emails, my web searches, everything. They couldn't pinpoint exactly who it was, but they narrowed it down to people with late night access to the building. The list included janitorial staff, security personnel, and a few employees who worked late shifts. One name jumped out at me, a night janitor named Paul. I had seen Paul around the building a few times, a quiet man in his 40s who always kept to himself. He worked the late night shifts, cleaning offices when most people had gone home. I never interacted with him beyond the occasional nod in the hallway. My stomach sank as I realized he had access to every office, every desk. It made sense now how the gifts kept appearing even after hours. I went to my boss and told him my suspicions. He agreed to have security look into it and told me to work from home until they sorted things out. I felt a little better knowing they were taking it seriously. But I couldn't shake the dread that had settled in. Two days later, I received a package at my apartment. There was no return address, just my name written on the front. My hand shook as I brought it inside and set it on the kitchen table. I opened it cautiously, feeling a wave of nausea as I peeled back the tape. Inside was a framed photo of me, taken at my desk in the office. It was recent, within the last week. 
I could tell because I recognized the clothes I was wearing. There was a small card tucked behind the photo that read, I'll see you soon. I called the police. They came to my apartment, took the package and the note as evidence, and filed a report. I explained everything that had been happening, from the gifts to the notes to the computer hacking. They listened carefully but didn't seem overly optimistic. They told me they'd investigate but that without a clear threat or physical evidence tying it to a specific person, it would be difficult to take action. After they left, I locked every door and window in the apartment and spent the night curled up on the couch, clutching my phone. The next morning, my boss called me. He said they had reviewed security footage from the past few weeks and found Paul on camera, entering my office at odd hours. He had been carrying small packages in and out of the building. They contacted the police with the new information and Paul was brought in for questioning. They didn't tell me much after that, just that Paul had been fired and that I could return to work if I wanted to, but I wasn't sure I could. The idea that he had been so close, had access to everything left me shaken. I stayed at my friend's place for a while, avoiding my own apartment, trying to put some distance between me and the whole experience. I live in New York City and work in Midtown, so like most people here, I rely on ride-hailing apps to get around. Between the chaos of the subway and the difficulty of finding parking, it's just easier. My daily routine typically involves taking a car to work in the morning, and then sometimes back home in the evening if I'm not up for the subway ride. I've been doing this for years and never really had any problems. That changed about six months ago. I first noticed something odd when I kept getting the same driver multiple times. At first, I didn't think much of it. I mean, with so many people using the app, I figured it wasn't too strange to get the same driver now and then. His name was Alex. He was in his mid-thirties with short, dark hair and a heavy accent. He seemed quiet but polite. He always greeted me and asked how my day was going, the usual small talk you'd expect. But then it started happening more often. I'd order a ride, and Alex would show up. Not just a few times a month, but almost every other day. One morning, he picked me up in front of my apartment for the third time that week. I joked about it, saying how funny it was that I kept getting the same driver. And he just smiled and nodded. I didn't think too much of it at the time. Maybe he just worked in my area a lot. Things started to get unsettling when I noticed him picking me up in different parts of the city. Once I ordered a ride from a friend's place in Brooklyn, a location I rarely visit, and he showed up. I remember feeling a strange flutter in my stomach when I saw his name pop up on the app. But again, I brushed it off. New York is a big city with countless drivers. It had to be a coincidence, right? I began to feel increasingly uncomfortable when I realized that Alex always seemed to know exactly where I'd be waiting. Typically, the app requires the driver to pull up and then look for the passenger, but he was always right there, engine idling, before I even got outside. I didn't understand how he could know exactly when I'd be coming out unless he was watching me on the app's GPS. I told myself I was just overthinking things, that he was just good at his job. But then one evening, something happened that really made me worry. I ordered a ride home from work, and as I stepped out of my building, I saw his car already parked by the curb. He was staring straight ahead, hands gripping the wheel. I paused for a second, feeling a shiver of unease, but got into the car. He greeted me in his usual monotone voice, and I forced a smile, keeping the conversation short. As we drove, I couldn't shake how off it felt. I glanced at the app on my phone and noticed that the ride hadn't started yet. Normally, drivers start the ride when they pick you up, but he hadn't done that this time. I asked him if he was going to start the ride, and he quickly apologized, tapping the screen. 
For the rest of the drive, I stared out the window, my mind racing. Had he been waiting there before I even ordered the ride? How did he always seem to be nearby? When I got home, I reported the incident to the ride-hailing app, explaining how often I was matched with this same driver and how he seemed to know my locations in advance. They responded with a generic message about driver rotation and random matching. I felt stupid for making a big deal out of what they made sound like a coincidence, but I couldn't shake the growing sense of discomfort. I decided to keep using the app, but I started taking more care with my pickup and drop-off points, opting to get picked up a block away from my apartment or at different spots near my work. For a while, things calmed down. I didn't get Alex as my driver again, and I felt like maybe I'd overreacted. But then, one Saturday evening, as I was heading out to meet friends for dinner, I walked outside my building and saw his car parked across the street. I froze my hand, instinctively gripping my phone in my pocket. He was just sitting there, staring at his phone, but it was unmistakably him. He didn't look up, didn't make any move toward me, but the fact that he was there at all made my skin crawl. I turned around and went back inside, watching him from behind the lobby's glass door. After a few minutes, he drove off. My heart pounded in my chest as I debated what to do. I called my friends and canceled dinner, telling them I wasn't feeling well. Then I sat in my apartment, every noise outside making me jump. I knew I should report this to someone, but what could I say? That a driver from the app was parked near my building? The police would probably dismiss it as nothing, and the app had already brushed off my concerns. After that, I changed my routines. I stopped using the ride-hailing app entirely and switched to walking or using public transit. I altered my routes to work and started leaving at different times. For a while, it seemed to work. I didn't see him around and I began to relax, thinking maybe it had just been an odd series of coincidences. Then one night, a couple of months later, I was coming home late from a work event. I decided to use the app again, telling myself I was being paranoid. I ordered a ride, and to my relief, a different driver's name appeared. I waited on the corner, watching the little car icon on the app get closer, when suddenly it changed. The screen flickered, and then the driver's name was replaced. It now read Alex. My blood ran cold. I looked up and saw his car turn the corner. He pulled up right in front of me, window down, giving me that same blank stare. I panicked and started walking away, my phone still in my hand. He called out to me, saying my name, but I ignored him and kept walking. My heart pounded as I ducked into a small bodega, watching through the glass as he sat there for a moment, then drove off. I told the cashier that someone was following me, and he let me stay in the store for a while. I called a friend who lived nearby, and she came to pick me up. When we got back to my apartment, I checked my phone. The ride had been marked as completed. I felt a surge of anger and fear. I immediately reported it to the app, explaining everything that had happened. They replied a day later saying they were investigating the incident and that the driver had been temporarily suspended. I didn't feel reassured. What did temporarily even mean? A few days passed, and I tried to get back to my normal life, though I was constantly on edge. I avoided using the app entirely and started taking taxis instead. One morning, as I was leaving for work, I saw something that made my stomach drop. Parked across the street was a car with tinted windows. It looked similar to Alex's, but I couldn't be sure. I told myself I was being paranoid and walked to the subway station, keeping my eyes straight ahead. As I descended the stairs, I glanced back and saw the car pull away from the curb and drive off. That night, I returned home and found a note taped to my front door. My heart skipped a beat as I read it. It was short, 
written in sloppy handwriting. I miss our rides. I stumble back, nearly dropping my keys. I rushed inside, locking the door behind me. My hands were shaking as I called the police, finally deciding that this was too much to ignore. They came and took my statement, looking around the building, but there wasn't much they could do. I showed them the note, and they took it for evidence, but without direct threats or proof of who had left it, they said their options were limited. I didn't sleep that night. I sat by the window, peering out through the blinds, jumping at every car that passed. The police had promised to patrol the area, but I didn't feel safe. The next morning, I called my landlord and asked if we could change the locks. He agreed, and I felt a small sense of relief as we swapped out the lock on my apartment door. For a while, nothing happened. Weeks went by without any sightings of Alex or strange notes. I still avoided the app sticking to taxis or public transit. I was starting to feel like maybe it was over, like he had finally given up. But then, one night as I was walking home from the subway station, I felt that familiar sense of dread. I turned the corner onto my street and there he was. His car was parked just a few doors down from my building. He was sitting in the driver's seat, staring straight ahead. I kept walking, forcing myself to stay calm. I passed his car, not daring to look at him, and hurried up the steps to my building. As I unlocked the door, I risked a glance back. He was still sitting there, eyes fixed on me. I rushed inside and bolted up the stairs to my apartment. My heart raced as I locked the door behind me and checked the peephole. I couldn't see him from this angle, but I could hear the low hum of his car engine outside. I grabbed my phone and called the police, my voice shaking as I explained that the driver was back and sitting outside my building. By the time the police arrived, he was gone. They took my statement again, promising to keep an eye on the area, but it felt like a losing battle. I couldn't prove that he was the one leaving the notes or that he was actively stalking me. They advised me to stay with someone else for a while if I felt unsafe. I packed a bag and went to stay with a friend for a few days. I don't know what to do next. I keep looking over my shoulder, expecting to see his car at every corner, every street I walk down. I thought about moving, changing jobs, anything to make him lose track of me. But I know that even if I do, the fear will always be there. I live in a college dorm at the University of Oregon. It's one of those older buildings with creaky floors and narrow hallways that always seem a little too dim, no matter how many lights they put up. I moved in at the start of the semester, and it was my first time living away from home. I was excited at first having my own space, decorating the room, meeting new people. It all felt like a fresh start. The dorm isn't luxurious by any means, but it's cozy enough. I share a bathroom with the other girls on my floor, and we all have our individual rooms. The first few weeks went smoothly. I got used to campus life, made some friends, and settled into my routine of classes and late-night study sessions. My dorm room became my little sanctuary. It wasn't big, but it had all my things. My bed, my desk, my books, and my laptop. I always kept it tidy. Everything had its place, and I got into the habit of locking my door whenever I left, even if it was just to go to the bathroom down the hall. It wasn't that I didn't trust people, but I'd heard stories about things getting stolen in dorms, so it was better to be safe. The first time something strange happened. I thought it was just my imagination. I came back to my room after a long day of classes to find my notebook lying open on my desk. I distinctly remembered closing it before leaving that morning. I stood there for a moment, staring at it, trying to convince myself that I'd just forgotten. I was tired and stressed from exams so it was entirely possible I was just being forgetful. I brushed it off and went about my evening trying to put it out of my mind. 
A few days later, I started noticing other things out of place. My toiletries in the bathroom would be moved. The drawer where I kept my snacks would be half open, even though I always made sure to close it. Small items like my hair ties or pens would go missing, only to reappear in random spots around the room days later. I started to feel paranoid, like I was losing track of my own belongings. I told myself I was just stressed from schoolwork and not paying enough attention to my surroundings. Then one night, I was up late studying for a midterm. It was probably around 2 a.m. and the dorm was dead quiet. I was sitting at my desk, surrounded by papers and my laptop when I heard a faint noise. It was coming from the window. My room is on the ground floor, facing a small courtyard. I paused, listening intently. It sounded like a scratching noise, almost like something brushing against the window pane. I turned my head slowly and stared at the window. The blinds were down, so I couldn't see outside. I sat there for a few more seconds, every muscle in my body tense, waiting for the noise to come again. But it didn't. It was just silence. I finally got up, my heart racing and peeked through the blinds. The courtyard was empty, lit by a dim yellow light from a nearby lamppost. I scanned the area, but nothing seemed out of the ordinary. With a shaky breath, I let the blinds fall back into place and sat down at my desk. I told myself it was probably just a tree branch or a stray animal. The next morning, I went to class and tried to forget about it. But as the days went on, the feeling of unease grew. I started becoming hyper-aware of my surroundings. I began double-checking the lock on my door every time I left, pushing on it to make sure it was secure. I stopped leaving my window open even during the day. I started taking inventory of my room mentally noting where I left everything before going to bed or heading out. Then came the night that changed everything. I was out late with some friends and I didn't get back to my dorm until around midnight. I was exhausted and just wanted to crash, so I fumbled with my keys, unlocked the door, and stepped inside. The moment I walked in, I knew something was wrong. The air felt different, almost stale, like it hadn't been disturbed in hours. I flipped on the light and looked around. Nothing seemed out of place at first, but then I noticed my bed. The blanket was pulled back, almost as if someone had been lying there. My pillow was dented with a small indentation right in the middle like the shape of a head. I stood frozen in the doorway, my mind racing. I hadn't made my bed that morning, but I certainly hadn't left it like that. I approached the bed cautiously, my heart pounding in my chest. I reached out and touched the pillow. It was cold. I backed away and quickly checked the rest of the room. The window was shut and locked. The closet door was slightly open and I hesitated before yanking it open. It was empty. I checked under the bed, behind the door, every corner of the small space. There was no one there. But someone had been. I felt it in my gut. I grabbed my phone and went to the bathroom down the hall, locking the door behind me. I called my friend, telling her in a hushed voice what had happened. She offered to come over, but I felt foolish. What could she do? I decided to sleep with the lights on that night. The next morning, I went to the dorm supervisor and told her what had happened. She listened, nodding sympathetically. But there wasn't much she could do. She suggested that maybe I was just tired and imagined it. I wanted to scream. I wasn't imagining it. Something was happening in my room, and I didn't know what to do. I decided to take matters into my own hands. I bought a cheap, motion-activated camera online and set it up on the bookshelf facing my bed. I needed to know if someone was coming into my room while I was out. I also placed a small piece of tape over the edge of the door where the frame met the door itself. 
If someone opened it while I was gone, the tape would fall off, and I'd know. For a few days, nothing happened. I checked the camera every evening and found nothing but hours of still footage. The tape on the door stayed in place. I began to feel a bit foolish, like maybe I had imagined the whole thing. Maybe I was just stressed and paranoid, making something out of nothing. Then one day, I came back from class and saw that the tape was gone. My heart skipped a beat as I approached the door. I unlocked it and pushed it open, my eyes immediately darting to the camera on the shelf. It was still there, the small red light blinking to show it was recording. I quickly grabbed it and locked myself in the bathroom to review the footage. My hands were shaking as I scrolled through the video. For a while, it was just the usual empty room, the same as always. Then, about an hour before I came back, something changed. The door slowly creaked open, and a figure slipped inside. My heart pounded as I watched, unable to tear my eyes away from the screen. It was a man. I couldn't see his face clearly. He was wearing a hooded sweatshirt pulled low over his head. He moved quietly, almost methodically, walking to my bed and sitting down. He sat there for a few moments, just staring at the wall. Then he lay back, pulling the blanket over himself like he was settling in to sleep. I felt a wave of nausea as I watched him lying in my bed, his chest rising and falling as he breathed. After what felt like an eternity, he got up, walked over to the camera, and stared directly into the lens. I gasped, dropping the phone in shock. His eyes were dark, almost empty, like he was looking through the camera at me. I grabbed the phone and ran to the dorm supervisor's office, bursting in and shoving the phone at her, babbling about what I had just seen. She watched the footage, her face going pale. She immediately called campus security, who came and reviewed the video. They took my statement and told me they would increase patrols around the dorms. I moved out that same day, packing my things and crashing on a friend's couch. A few days later, campus security found evidence that the man had been getting in through an unlocked window in the hallway, crawling in through the common bathroom window and sneaking into my room. They never caught him. They didn't know if he was a student or someone from outside the campus. They just told me to be careful and report anything suspicious. I'm living off campus now, in an apartment with two roommates, and I have locks on every door and window. But I still have trouble sleeping. Every creak, every rustle of leaves outside my window sends me into a panic. I keep the camera set up in my room just in case. I'll never forget the way he looked into the lens, like he knew I'd be watching, like he was trying to send me a message. Thank you for watching. If you found these stories gripping, don't forget to subscribe for more spine-tingling content. For another hair-raising tale, check out our suggested video. And if you're hungry for more eerie encounters, dive into our playlist featuring similar chilling narratives.